Beyond Ourselves by Catherine Marshall. Chapter 12. Ego Slaying. I shall long remember a certain June day in 1955. It was spent with a group of 13 Christian friends at a rustic lodge in the rolling Maryland countryside. This day in the woods was to be a time apart. The plan was to share portions of two books, C.S. Lewis's Beyond Personality and A.W. Tozer's The Divine Conquest. Then we would separate for some individual meditation on what we had read. After that, lunch, more sharing, and some prayer. It was hoped that the day would end with some definite step forward towards Christian maturity. Tozer's thoughts and Lewis's are now merged in my mind. But as I remember, what we were studying could be summarized this way. A misconception that many church people have is the theory that with Christ's help, we can become, quote unquote, nice people. This teaches that the good in man can be separated from the bad and the good developed. It says that education is the answer to most problems. It admonishes us to self-effort, human endeavor. Our lives are to be man's best with God's help. The main trouble with the quote-unquote nice people theory is that when we try living by it, we find ourselves getting nowhere. What is more, it is not Christianity. Nowhere do the scriptures tell us that with God's help, we can sort out the good and evil in ourselves and cultivate the good. Rather, these writers insist that ever since the first man and woman were tempted to pull away from their creator, hoping that they would be as gods, all men have been tainted with the same desire to bow the knee to no one but themselves. Our nature might be compared to an apple shot through with brown specks of imperfection. There is no way to cut out every brown speck and save the apple. The doom of decay is on the fruit. Just so, each of us is tinctured with self-will, with self-ambitions, with the desire to be pampered, cushioned and admired, with overcriticalness of everyone else and oversensitiveness about ourselves, with a drive to enlarge the self with an accumulation of things. Thus try as we may to separate these self-centered qualities from the unselfish ones, the self keeps cropping up again and again, tripping us every time. What is Christ's solution to our dilemma? It is recorded for us in the eighth chapter of Mark. Whosoever will save his life shall lose it, he says, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall save it. To put it another way, there is no solution apart from the painful all-out one of handing over to him all of our natural self to be destroyed, the good parts of the apple along with the brown specks, so that Christ can give us a new self, one born from above, one in which he will live at the center of our being. If the idea of Christ living at the center of life frightens us, it may be because we fear that by handing over self-will, we would then become spineless creatures colorless carbon copy personalities. We need not, need not be afraid on either count. Actually, it is when selfishness and self-will progressively take over in our society that we become carbon copies of one another. When an adolescent is still unsure of his selfhood, he has a horror of being in any way different from his friends. When adults are not in the least concerned about pleasing God, they are desperately concerned about pleasing each other. When we have few inner resources, we hold up masks to hide our poverty. And all the masks seem to be turned out by the same factory. Suburbia, the organization man, the man in the gray flannel suit, all aided by mass advertising extended by the media of mass communication. Whenever we exchange self-will for God's will, we find greater strength, a finer quality of iron in the new will given us. And by a strange paradox, we then become more individualistic with more unique personalities than we would have thought possible. That is because 
we have exchanged the mask for the real self. On that day of retreat, I remember being impressed with how vividly C.S. Lewis expressed it. I copied several sentences in my notebook. C.S. Lewis writes, Christ says, give me all. I don't want so much of your money and so much of your work. I want you. I have not come to torment your natural self, but to kill it. No half measures are any good. I don't want to cut off a branch here and a branch there. I want to have the whole tree down. I don't want to drill the tooth or crown it or stop it, but I have to have it out. Hand over the whole natural self, all the desires which you think innocent, as well as the ones you think wicked, the whole outfit. I will give you a new self instead. In fact, I will give you myself. My own will shall become yours. To the Apostle Paul, this matter of handing over the whole man to Christ to be annihilated was at the heart of Christianity. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, that is, with Christ, to do away with our sinful body so that we might not be enslaved to sin any longer. To Paul, the essence of sin lay in a man's life being ruled by my will be done rather than by God's will be done. There is, he was saying, a fundamental choice at the heart of life. It is simply, who is going to be the master? And if we fail to make a conscious choice on this, then we make it by default. In that case, self will rule from the throne of our hearts. As we sat in the living room of the rustic retreat lodge that day, some of us on cushions on the floor, Sheldon Turner, the lawyer and lay leader who was guiding the discussion, pointed out that the relatively new science of psychology has, independently of theology, arrived at the same conclusion. There is no maturity or fulfillment of man's personality apart from the slaying of egocentricity. A psychiatrist put it this way, Egocentricity in any form always leads to difficult experiences which we call crises. The more we are egocentric and therefore rigid, the less we are able to bear life's burdens. Increasing egocentricity destroys itself. He who tries to save his life kills himself. This is as it should be since the breakdown of the ego, the collapse of the system of mistaken ideas which, like a shell, encase the self and limit the expression of its power, is one basic aim of human destiny. Just before lunch that day, paper and pencils were handed around, and each of us tried putting down the characteristics of the self-centered person as opposed to the God-centered person. Combining lists, they looked something like this. On the egocentric personality side, listed were, my will be done, is intent on self-glory, is concerned about other people's opinions of self, craves admiration and popularity, is rigid, self-opinionated, and cannot stand criticism, desires power over others, uses others for his own ends wants ease, is self-indulgent, holds self-preservation of supreme importance, tries to be self-sufficient, has a practical atheism by which he feels he does not need God's help, feels that life owes him certain things, is oversensitive, feelings easily hurt, nourishes resentments, springs back slowly, painfully from disappointments, trusts in material possessions for security, indulges in self-pity when things go wrong, needs praise and publicity for his good deeds, is tolerant of even blind to his own sins, appalled at the evil in others, is self-complacent, craves the peace of mind that relieves him of unwelcome responsibilities, and loves those only who love him. Now, on the God-centered personality side, the list read something like this. Thy will be done. 
has true humility, is increasingly free from the necessity for the approval or praise of others, is flexible, handles criticism objectively and usually benefits from it, is devoted to the common good. Ease given up when necessary, knows that many comforts precious to the self may have to go, is aware that you lose your life to find it, is acutely aware of his need of God in everyday life, realizes that life owes him nothing, that goodness cannot earn him anything, readily forgives others, has capacity to rise above disappointments and use them creatively, know that security is in relationship to God, not in things, has objective resiliency when things go wrong, works well with others, can take second place, understands the potential evil in himself and lays it before God, is not shocked at any evil possibility in self or others, knows that warfare between good and evil will not allow undisturbed peace, can love the unlovely and has a feeling of oneness in God toward all humanity. When the group gathered again after lunch, one girl asked immediately, but how does one deal with the my will be done? Who can ever get rid of self completely? Perhaps not in this life, Sheldon said thoughtfully, but no human progress could have been made in any field had we followed the line that if we can't do everything perfectly, we won't try. Remember, Christ promises us a miracle with this ego slain, a much bigger portion of self slain in this life than we think is possible. The girl repeated her question. All right, how do you go about it? Sheldon then quoted Paul's words. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. It was pointed out that the have died is the past perfect tense. It looks back to a definite point in the past. Therefore, this matter of getting rid of the old tyrant self is a deliberate step, exactly as entering into the Christian life is a definite step. We worked out a plan for ego slaying, which goes something like this. We see the limitation of self-centered living and the danger of it in every area. We pass sentence on the natural self by telling God that we are willing to have him slay it. Our statement of willingness is a definite act at a given time. We accept by faith the fact that God has heard us, that the next action will be his. We reckon by faith that he has indeed undertaken the execution. There will be a crisis or series of crises. We live through them step by step. This is the overt evidence that the slaying of the self has been undertaken. And five every day of our lives shall still have to choose between selfishness and unselfishness. But the big decision to let Christ rather than the self rule makes all the smaller decisions easier. This is the taking up the cross day after day of which Christ spoke. Sheldon warned the group that we had better not tell God that we desired ego slaying unless we meant it. For no one can predict what painful experiences God will allow in order to make the experience real. After all, each man's self-will takes a different form and God is going to touch self-interest at its most vulnerable spot. Then he went on to add Riley, but I don't want you to sound I don't want to sound too grim. Maybe this will be of some comfort to you. For you who have already embarked on the Christian life, this execution of self is something that has to happen sooner or later, here or in the next life. So you may as well get on with it. Get it over with so that you can break through to real happiness now. He grinned at us and his blue eyes held a special light. We had known this remarkable layman for a long time. Somewhere back in his past, he had left self behind to a degree that scarcely seemed possible. Yet he had not only survived the experience, but became one of the most delightful personalities I know, successful in his profession, powerful in his way with other men. What Sheldon called the execution of self 
is the great crisis or the series of smaller crises of which the psychiatrist spoke in the quotation previous. This is Paul's old self in the process of crucifixion, and it is only human to flee that. Christianity, most of us think, is fine up to a point, so long as we can make it serve us, so long as it gives us peace of mind, settles some of the dust of our inner conflicts, makes us more likable people. Well, fine. But of course, this is peripheral stuff. This is interpreting Christianity as a rosewater philosophy to make a comfortable atmosphere for nice people. But nice people have no cutting edge, nor have they any answers for the problems that beset our world. We begin to see that no man is worthy to rule until he has been ruled. No man can lead well until he has given himself to leadership greater than his own. Even Jesus Christ was no exception. Repeatedly, he said he was not carrying out his own will, but the will of the one who sent him. I found Sheldon Turner's thought disturbing. The Christ of the cross isn't going to become real to you until you come to terms with this hard core of reality at the heart of Christianity. How could he be real to you when you, not he, are still at the center of your life? As the woods around the lodge grew dark and the retreat drew to a close, we had much to think about. Those of us who decided to take the plunge did not do so lightly. In fact, we felt rather as if we were agreeing to a sort of spiritual Russian roulette. Before parting and driving back to Washington, we agreed that we would check back with one another to find out what had happened to us following the retreat. In actual fact, how would God make real to us this slaying of self? Looking back now, I know that not one of us could have guessed. It would take a book in itself to tell the details of what happened to the seven of us who said yes to the risky adventure of ego slaying. For what I can tell here, I have changed names and a few details in order not to embarrass the friends concerned. One businessman, Ed, was touched at two points, his masculinity and his professional reputation. He was the sort of married man who enjoyed flirting with women up to a point, especially with women much younger than he. He had told himself that the flirting game was harmless fun, so long as he always stopped short of actual affairs. I do not think it had occurred to him that in feeding his masculine ego with the adoration and flattery of young secretaries, that he ran the risk of their falling in love with him and getting hurt. It seems that for weeks, he had been driving Isabel, the youngest girl in the office, home from work each afternoon. The attention of an older man, especially the boss, had been flattering. In her room at night, Isabel built dream castles, romanticized every gesture, every remembered sentence. She even wrote the boss a series of love letters. She had no intention of mailing them and kept them locked in a leather jewelry case in her dressing table drawer. One night, she forgot to lock the case. In the process of cleaning her daughter's room the following day, Isabel's mother found the letters. From then, she concluded that her daughter was having an affair with her boss. Incensed at the idea of an older man seducing an innocent girl, she decided on a course of action. Soon, Ed received an anonymous letter. It accused him of adultery and threatened to reveal the matter to his wife and to the board of directors. At first, he regarded the letter as a joke. He was not guilty of adultery. No doubt the letter had been written by some crackpot. Contemptuously, he tore it into small bits and tossed the pieces into the wastebasket. But by the time the second, the third, and the fourth letters arrived, each more violent than the last and now threatening blackmail, Ed was in a fine state of nerves. The reiterated threat of the anonymous writer to go to his wife made him decide to tell her about it himself. In addition, he went to the District of Columbia Chief of Police with the letters in hand and told him the story. Using the United States mails for attempted blackmail is a penal offense, so the officers went into action. Through clever detective work, the mother was apprehended. 
when the chief of police telephoned Ed to tell him that the anonymous writer was Isabel's mother, he was horrified. How could just driving a girl home from work a few times result in such serious misunderstanding? Then he had a clear-eyed look at himself and his old habit of using women for what he had regarded as harmless ego satisfactions. With a new humility, he paid a call on Isabel and her terrified family. It must have been quite a scene in their family living room that evening. Ed said afterward that during those hours, he became a man. He assumed full responsibility for what had happened. He assured the girl's parents that there was no affair. Gently, he tried to spell out to Isabel how much he loved his wife and valued his marriage, and he asked her forgiveness for what she had interpreted as unspoken promises. Isabel's mother would actually have received a prison sentence had not Ed personally gone to court and pleaded for leniency. He knew the judge having played golf with him at the Burning Tree Club. Realizing by now the connection between the sequence of events and the ego slaying he had pledged, Ed felt that, pride or not, there was nothing for him to do but tell the whole story to the judge in his chambers. Surely, he told the judge, this woman had learned her lesson and would never repeat such an offense. It would be devastating to the family to have the mother taken away. And Isabel and her two younger brothers might never live down the stigma of their mother being sentenced to prison. So, after a stern lecture to the mother, the judge suspended sentence and paroled her. But the detectives who had worked so hard to apprehend her at Ed's request felt that justice had not been done and made no attempt to hide their anger at Ed and his softness. This was hard on his pride, too. Thus, the crisis ended. It had come only two weeks after Ed's decision at the retreat. Though the seven of us had known one another for a long time, we marveled that Ed wanted to share so intimate an experience with us. He insisted on doing so. Telling it to this one group of close friends is part of the therapy, I guess. Besides, it will make it harder for me ever to repeat such immature nonsense. Sheldon warned us all that this process would be painful. It sure was. Yet I'm grateful, ever so grateful, that it happened to me. Out of Ed's experience and those of others, we began to see some of the characteristic ways God handles the slaying of the old self. In one sense, the crisis is not sent by God, that is, imposed from above. In each instance, the emergency is the direct result of weakness, the rigidity, the lack of wisdom of one's own self-centered actions. However, the timing of the various crises in the weeks following the retreat seemed remarkable. Another feature common to all the emergencies was that they never got so completely out of hand that permanent damage resulted to the individual involved or to other people. The dagger thrusts were against the false values, against the evil masquerading as good. The real self emerged unhurt, indeed stronger than ever, with a fresh ability to stand up to life's problems. As in Ed's experience, God seemed to keep his finger on the situation, directing it, stopping it short of disaster. This seemed to us awe-inspiring proof of God's love for the individual, that divine love that combines in such an inimitable way tenderness and the iron of discipline. Ed told us that he thought he understood now what the writer of Hebrews had meant when he wrote, The Lord disciplines the man he loves. God is treating you as sons. Discipline always seems for the time to be a thing of pain, not of joy. But those who are trained by it reap the fruit of it afterwards. Included in the group of seven was one minister. Roger had an impelling personality and had been born with a gift for preaching. Some 13 years out of seminary, he was then the popular pastor of a thriving Lutheran church in Northern Virginia. Roger's crisis was merely uncomfortable compared to the pain Ed suffered probably because Roger had already dealt more forcibly with the old self-centered tendencies than the rest of us. In the last few years, Roger explained to us, I've had several overtures from other churches about becoming their pastor. 
some have been important churches in our Lutheran conference. It's quite flattering to be waited upon by a pulpit committee to be asked to preach a trial sermon to a congregation in some distant city, to be dined and fetid and wooed, to be offered all sorts of inducements to accept their call. I'd been telling myself that I had no way of knowing what God wanted me to do with each of these offers unless I investigated them. Sometimes that resulted in carrying the negotiations quite far. So the pulpit committees would be most hopeful that I would come. In the interim, my own church would plead with me not to go, sometimes offer inducements for me to stay. Then in the end, I would know that I had to turn down the offer of the pulpit committee. But wasn't that sort of ecclesiastical flirting, someone asked. Roger smiled. I know that now. It was similar to the flirting Ed has told us about, and for the same reason. My ego got well fed every time by the process. What was the crisis, I asked. Shortly after the retreat, I received an overture from a church in Denver, Colorado. My wife and I went out there at the church's expense. Delightful trip. There were flowers in the hotel suite, corsages for Betty. There were newspaper stories with pictures of Betty and me, headlines like visiting pastor likes hospitality of Denver or Virginia minister to preach at 11 a.m. service tomorrow, possible successor to Dr. So-and-so. We found the church divided down the middle theologically. Their previous minister had been an arch conservative who had split hairs about the second coming of Christ. It was unfortunate for me that my visit got newspaper publicity. Two days after we got home, I received a letter saying that the pulpit committee had recommended that the congregation call me, but that the congregational meeting had voted 608 to 462 not to. They didn't think me doctrinally sound or something. I know this may seem trivial to the rest of you, but my pride smarted for days. <laughs> Betty laughed and said it was good for me. She's right, of course. But that newspaper publicity, especially the headline that read, Denver Church won't call pastor, views on Christ given as reason. My views on Christ weren't the reason at all. That hurt because Christ is everything to me. <clears throat> Don't think the whole story didn't filter back to Virginia, too. Huh. Well, as a result, I've had to face up to the fact that trifling with the feelings of a group of people, like churches, just won't do. And I've been probing for my motives in what you've called my ecclesiastical flirting. Mixed up in it is always the temptation to run away from problems in my own church. Then there's the flattery of being wanted by two congregations. But the worst part of it has been the lack of strict honesty with myself and with everyone else. From now on, Roger concluded, I've got to be honest, completely honest in the most transparent sort of way. I lived through Beverly's crisis with her since she and I were the closest of friends. We had the intimacy that comes through sharing the deeps of life together. At first, we had been drawn together because we were both widows with sons to rear. Beverly has two boys, Kenneth, a teenager, and his younger brother, Sam. Her husband had been lost in World War II in the New Guinea jungle. At first, he had been declared missing in action, but as the months melted into years, Bev's initial hope died and was replaced by a conviction that Jim would never come back. Nor did he. His body was never found. All of this she had shared with me and much more. During one of the recesses at the, recesses at the retreat, Bev and I had been sitting out under the trees. I certainly needed this retreat, she confided. I've been so mixed up recently. There's a barrier between me and the boys, especially Kenneth. I can't seem to get through to him at all. There's no zest in my work. I don't even get any fun out of recreation these days. The other night, 
a friend took me to the blue room of the Shoreham. Suddenly, right in the middle of dinner, it was as if some part of me had detached itself and was standing off to the side watching objectively. And what did you see? Bev leaned her brown curly hair back against the tree trunk. Oh, a lot of people, including me, determinedly working at trying to have fun. There was pretense at the heart of our play. You know, a sort of attitude of, this evening is costing me plenty, I've paid for it, so I'm going to have fun if it kills me. We both laughed. <clears throat> I know what you mean, I said. Well, anyway, Bev continued, already today I've found out what's wrong with me. My friend toyed with a piece of grass reflectively. Right after Jim went away, I did ask God to take over my life, rule it, but self has crept back and has been doing a lot of ruling in God's place. Looking on from the outside, it doesn't strike me that way, I objected. It's true though. I've been compromising in the matter of drinking, for instance, and that can't be best for my boys. I find myself taking a cocktail sometimes when I don't want one at all, just so folks won't think I'm different. That's caring far too much about other people's opinions of me and not enough about my own. Then there's the matter of selfish use of time. I haven't been putting myself out for the boys. Some of their interests, like baseball, I find beastly boring, but I'm not making enough effort to identify with them. There's more, too. We were called back to the lodge then, but with this much new insight into herself, Bev was one of the seven who decided to take the plunge in ego slaying. Her crisis began on a certain Monday morning, which was to hold heartache and drama for her. At 7.30, the telephone rang. It was a detective of the 6th Precinct Juvenile Squad. His voice was gentle. He well knew that what he was about to tell this young widow would be a blow. Her Kenneth and three other boys had gotten into trouble on Saturday night. They had taken some property from their school, two axes and a fire extinguisher, and had broken the headlights of two school buses. Bev told me later that she began trembling so violently that she could scarcely hold the telephone. You and your son will have to appear at the 6th Precinct Station at 3.30 this afternoon, the detective concluded. Bev hung up and immediately dialed me. I was shocked for her but asked no questions over the phone. I'll be over as soon as I can get dressed, I told her. Her voice was quivering. How on earth could Kenneth do something like that? I just don't understand. <clears throat> she started crying and we both hung up. When I got to Bev's home, I found Kenneth with her in the den. She had kept him home from school so that we could talk with him before the 3.30 hearing. The boy was 14, tall, in the gawky stage. His face was alternately flushed and pale that morning his features pinched beneath a reddish shock of hair. His mother kept insisting, Kenneth, you've got to tell us everything. It would be awful if anything else were sprung on us this afternoon. It's time for honesty now, real honesty. Otherwise, how can we help you? But Kenneth had little to say. <coughs> Plead and probe as we would. He claimed that we knew everything that there was to know. The barrier between him and his mother was there, all right. Then the school principal telephoned. He wanted to see Kenneth later that morning. After the boy had gone, Bev and I prayed together. It was one of those real prayers when two people mean business and get down to cases. Both of us wept. That afternoon, we spent three hours at the precinct station. Two men from the juvenile board were an hour and 45 minutes late arriving. We waited with the other parents in the front room watching the hands of the clock move with maddening slowness. I remember one father in particular, a man with black hair peppered with gray and large luminous brown eyes. He was wearing clothes that didn't match and tennis shoes in the middle of winter. And the sad shocked face of another father, his eyes with the look of a hurt animal's. 
One mother with a lined face had brought along the little family dog. She held the terrier close to her with a leash made from her son's tie. The parents of one boy were abroad and in their place had come a relative who was a psychiatrist, young and prematurely gray. I could almost see his trained mind wrestling with the question of what had happened to these boys from good families. Finally, the two officials arrived and we were asked to go into a back room. Though it was informal, there was nevertheless a courtroom atmosphere. The juvenile board sat behind the one long table. There were several benches for the boys and their parents. I looked at Bev and knew that her head was throbbing and that tears were close to the surface. While we waited for the hearing to begin, one of the boys, the son of the man with the shocked, hurt eyes, put his head down on the table and began sobbing. He cried softly, not wanting to attract attention, trying to smother the sound with his arms. Later, we found out that since early childhood, the boy had wanted to go to West Point. If this incident went down on police record, he would never achieve his heart's desire. Through it all, Kenneth seemed to have a permanent blush. He kept chewing his fingernails long after there was no bit of surplus nail to chew. It came out in the questioning that he was the one who had bought beer for the other boys. How much had the beer been responsible for their conduct? Who could tell? I knew that Bev would be connecting her recent leniency on drinking with her sons buying the beer. Kenneth stood straight and said, Sir, I looked at him and suddenly felt sure that this boy would turn out all right. But that didn't lessen the agony I felt for Bev and Kenneth. The men on the juvenile squad could not have been more compassionate and understanding in their handling of the situation. No word appeared in the Washington newspapers. Wisely, they strung the matter out enough so that Kenneth was badly frightened. A week after the first hearing, he and Bev had to go down to the juvenile court again. Of course, they were required to pay for the property damage. But in the end, convinced that these boys had learned their lesson, the board dismissed their cases with no record against them. Once again, God had permitted circumstances to go only as far as severe discipline would dictate, but not to permanent hurt. A week later, Bev was saying to me, I didn't know a mother's pride of ownership in her children could make her so vulnerable my sons, the fear that my reputation would be hurt, the possible reflection on my dead husband's good name, all self-pride. I know that my insistence on owning my children was the crux of my problem with Kenneth. Kenneth is an individual in his own right. He belongs to God, not to me. He's just been loaned to me for a few years. Since then, I've been talking to my son person to person. I've admitted some of my mistakes and fears and weaknesses where I need his help. Catherine, this one week I have watched a miracle unfolding. Bev's face glowed with her discovery. The wall between us has come crashing down like the walls of Jericho. Once again, quick tears swam in her eyes. This time tears of happiness, relief and gratitude. One cannot live through experiences like the seven of us had and retain any doubts about the thrust of a living Lord into contemporary life. We learn much in a short time, the literalness of his standing outside the door of our hearts and never intruding until we invite him in. The immediacy of his invasion of our lives when we do open the door. His overweening concern that we call a halt to our trifling with life and move on toward maturity and effectiveness. His incisive knowledge of the most vulnerable weaknesses in each of us, who but Christ could know so unerringly that point of mutiny, so covertly hidden even from ourselves. All this left us wondering, awestruck, worship him? Of course, how can we help it? For he is the only one worthy of worship supremely worthy and yet the first step in the direction of that great love must always be ours.